everybody. Hello, hello. I am so excited at how many faces I see in here right now. Hello, everybody. I am your MC, Amanda Kulong. This is, I think, my fifth year. Carolyn, is that right? Wow, thank you. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, very quickly, when we are finished with this um, keynote presentation, please stay in your seats because we will also be hearing from our founder, Carolyn Layton, at the end. So make sure that, you know, we stay nice and calm there. But let's jump right into this. Tonight's keynote speaker grabbed the world's attention with her Oscar speech addressing equal pay for women. She currently plays the leading role in the TV series CSI Cyber, but in addition to being an award-winning actor, she also embodies the true meaning of a global citizen. Since the 2010 Haitian earthquake, her nonprofit givelove.org has shed light on the global sanitation crisis and finding solutions for affordable housing. She's not afraid to get her own hands dirty or to speak up for what's right. So without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to Patricia Arquette. Oh, look at all these beautiful women. Woo! It's very exciting to be in this room. It's very exciting to be in this room with such an incredible powerhouse of women. I'm very grateful to be included and in witty this year. I am not really a very tech savvy person, <laughs> although I do play one on TV, on CSI Cyber. So I just pretend to be as brilliant as all of you. But even I am starting to understand the incredible opportunities that we could harness by using technology to ease suffering for mankind. In my work with NGO, our NGO, GiveLove.org, we work on ecological sanitation, which is a millennial goal. The system we use is called thermophilic composting. It's very low cost and a very low tech solution. But even in this, we're hoping to launch a low bandwidth learning component. Modules that can be transferred into multiple language, languages for skills transfer. We want to transfer the knowledge of composting human waste safely and efficiently so that communities can improve public health and help protect water resources. These are skills that can empower and help save lives and communities. Communities that cannot wait for NGOs to come. But skills transfer through technology is not our strong suit. But we will have to persevere because we know this is a way to make aid more successful and to make it possible to have a bigger impact. Because aid as it stands today is bloated and inefficient. We're talking about a world where more people have cell phones than have toilets. And as we all know, a lot can be transferred by cell phone. 2.5, <laughs> like maybe a module on how to set up a sanitation system in your own community. We're hoping that the knowledge of setting up community sanitation systems can become one of those things. Because the capacity in the old model of aid to deliver programs are limited by costs. So in this way, technology can indeed help change the world. It's strange. It's a strange thing to work in ecological sanitation. But the truth is the lack of sanitation is the number one pollutant to water, and the lack of sanitation and waterborne disease kills more kids globally than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. As of now, we're working in Haiti, Nicaragua, and soon we'll be working in India. So tech can really change the world for the better. Tech is responsible for great strides in medicine, research, scientific data collection, really in a wide range of areas. But emotionally, it seems while we're more connected than ever, we're also less connected. And real connection has a real value. We're all individuals, but we're all part of something bigger than us, parts of many things, parts of many communities. I'm a mother, and I was a single mother at 20. I lost my mother to breast cancer. I am many things, and I've lived through many things, and I'm letting you know that so that when we get to the question and answer session, you can feel free to touch on any of those topics. They're all part of who I am, my individual, authentic self, and we all have that self. 
We all have something that brings us here to this party. We all have parts of us that are connected. And when we're working from that part, we can change our, something for ourselves and for others. I don't think I could be an actress and not an activist. I don't think I could be a mother but not a professional. I couldn't just see myself as an activist in America alone. I see myself as a citizen of the world and I see us all connected. I wouldn't be happy if I wasn't expressing and exploring those sides of myself. So what makes you happy? Who do you want to be? I have asked myself this and I will continue to ask this throughout my life. But in this and in all things, the greatest opponent I've ever faced and will ever face is myself. I almost wasn't an actress. When I graduated from high school, I was uncertain that if I didn't know if I wanted to be an actress or a midwife. I really wanted to be both. But the truth was the idea of being an actress was much more terrifying. I grappled with many interior opponents my own opponents, many scary and ugly thoughts that could paralyze my mind. For instance, the possibility of being without talent, being a bad actress, putting myself in a position of being rejected, which is the norm in acting. You have to deal with rejection daily. The, the idea of investing all my dreams in a business where a committee of others get to decide if I'm of worth or not, if I had talent or not. The idea of joining an industry where beauty was an expectation for women, the pressure to be beautiful. When I was raised in a family where I was free of that conversation, expectation, or awareness that beauty was a commodity. Would I be able to maintain who I was in the midst of an industry that had so many things that I disagreed with? So while I wanted to be both a midwife and an actress, there was one thing I wanted more than either of those things. The thing I wanted most of all was to be brave. So I decided the bravest thing I could really do was gamble it all on failure, to be willing to fail, but not in some usual failure by not trying. I decided to put myself in a position to fail by trying everything, to decide to put myself in a position to fail completely, commit myself completely. I gave myself in my experiment one year, one year of total dedication. I decided to do something every day towards becoming a professional actress. Every day I took initiative. Every day I would go to an acting class, dissect a performance, take pictures for headshots, go on audition and try. And when I would get feedback after an audition that I was too green, or that I was bad, or that I was stiff, I would actually see it as a win. A win, because the end game was to be brave, not to be famous. The end game was to stand in the face of fear. So I was surprised when I got a part, and then I was terrified to show up at work and realize that again I was learning from scratch because acting on a set is drastically different than in a classroom. So maybe I stunk in that first movie. And of course that was hard for my ego, but again, I had to persevere through that because my objective was to be brave brave enough to be bad. I was successful because I was brave. And to the brave, the world goes. Many years later and many lessons later, I am an actress. But I'm also a loudmouth. <laughs> and I think I was probably invited here because I was lucky enough to receive an Oscar this year for Best Supporting Actress for a movie called Boyhood. <laughs> And when I did, I opened my mouth and I talked about women's rights and equal pay in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was a dangerous thing to do because we're all living in a world of corporations and it's the corporate interests that buy ad time and, and that's how you make a living and those are the people that ultimately end up funding a lot of films. But I've always fought the status quo and I came in to be a game changer. I never bought the party line that I had to lose weight to play a normal woman in America. <sighs> but the truth is I do work in a business where great actresses like Maggie Gyllenhaal, 
are told they are too old at 37 years old to play the love interest of a 55-year-old man. <laughs> and I know that you all deal with ageism in tech like we deal with ageism in Hollywood. You deal with sexism in tech like we deal with sexism in Hollywood. But I always knew the system was wrong. In Hollywood, I literally had conversations where I would say to them, you're losing your female audience. I have told them since then, I won that award because I was playing a woman that people could identify with, not a fantasy. I tell them, you guys are missing the point. You're leaving money on the table. You don't believe, women don't believe the fantasy you are trying to force down their throats. If I was in tech, I would say part of my strategy might be to tell them women make 87% of the purchasing decisions. You cannot understand user interface or any level of consumer need for women if you don't have females at every critical phase. You need women to ask and answer questions of how women need things to be, how women respond to things, how things feel to women, to design products that work for them from the ground up. You need women on boardrooms who understand your consumers, who are your consumers. As far as aging out of the tech world, I say again, this is a grave mistake. Those companies are making a huge mistake. With work experience you and age, you not only bring further skills, you also bring efficiency and competency to problem solving and team building and communicating. You are grown adults. You have been through multiple challenges in your life and you have skill sets that younger people won't have for years. Women are 51% of the population, and the companies of the future will be designing with women, because in short order, they will understand that women are more complicated than any algorithm they could ever dream up. <laughs> and real women are going to be need to be there to build and grow. So I won that Academy Award for my specific role, a role that's not usually seen on film. My role was that of a working, imperfect mother, the type of mother we all know but we never see on film. And that's a great testament to our director, Richard Linkletter. A man who was raised in a large part by his single mother. A woman who had to support her kids and send herself back to school and support her kids to try to earn a better living for them. She followed her interests so she could be a full and vital human being. When I thought about the possibility of winning that award, because after all I had a one in five shot, I thought, well, if I do win, then I'm going to support that woman that I played and the millions of women like her, women like Richard's mother, women like my own mother, like myself at times in my life, women like many of you. I took a look at my character and I thought about how different her life would have been if she had made one full dollar that she had earned. I spoke with friends of mine like Camila Lopez of the upcoming documentary Equal Means Equal. That examines how archaic and vicious long-standing practices affect women in multiple areas. That this inequity has enormous impacts. We are dealing with something in plain sight, but we're so conditioned to accept it that it's institutionalized our behavior. So lately I've been having this conversation about how women are paid less than men, how that pay difference costs women $400,000 to $2 million over their lifetime. I've been talking about the fact that we tell our daughters to go to college, even though we know with the systems that are in place, it will take them years longer to pay back their college loans through legal loopholes in our justice system. We, we allow this even we know this is historic economic subjugation, even though we know the laws in place are so inadequate that the wage gap is not expected to close until 2058, if ever. I've been having this conversation with people about how we actually live in our new America. How we have a demographic where 50% of white families are being supported by single mothers. I'm talking about how white women are paid 78 cents on the dollar to their male counterparts. I'm talking about the fact that 70% of African American families are being raised by single mothers today. And how the typical African American woman is being paid a brutalizing 68 cents on every dollar. I've been talking about how in Los Angeles, the seventh largest economy in the world, last year Latina women were paid 44 cents on the dollar. 
I am talking about the fact that this is part of the continued systemic economic smothering of the African American and Latino communities. I am talking about corporate robbery. I am talking about continuing the ugly history of creating second, third, and fourth class citizens. Citizens we value less because of their sex and their color of their skin. I'm talking about America, the richest country in the world. One of only nine countries on earth that doesn't have equality for women as a provision in the Constitution. Even though we demanded Afghanistan to include it in their Constitution, we don't have it in ours. But women aren't just being paid less for doing the same jobs, they're paid less for less comparable jobs. Let's see, this is strange, but valet car parkers make more money normally than childcare workers. Is there anything wrong with this equation? Do we value our cars more than our kids? I've been talking about how if women were paid the same $1 as their white male counterparts, half of the 66 million women and children living in poverty in America would no longer be. That means if they were just paid a fair wage, 33 million women and children would no longer be in poverty in America. Women who are penalized because they were born female. I have been talking about how our trans sisters cannot even get jobs and are murdered without adequate investigation or prosecution. I'm talking about the fact that we never passed the ERA. And I'm wondering if we had if there would be legal grounds to demand the processing of tens of thousands of unprocessed rape kits across the United States. Kits that were not proce processed because it was not made a priority. And why isn't the prosecu prosecutions of one of the most destructive violent crimes known to man a priority? Is it because most of the victims are female? I've been thinking about how we have lawmakers who have the power to decide for us our legal reproductive health rights, even though they may believe, as one recently said, that in the case of a legitimate rape, our bodies will spontaneously abort. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> These people don't even know the basics of reproductive health, and they are in the driver's seats. Without the ERA, we don't legally have the teeth that a constitutional amendment would give us. We can't take class action against corporations for widespread, widespread pay inequality because we have to prove intent before. Even though a corporation's been paying women less systemically across the board, I've been wondering if we did pass the ERA, that there might be grounds to compel universities to look at campus rape and the Departments of Justice to intervene to take actions to halt sexual violence towards women once and for all. I've been talking about how even in the nursing field, which is largely dominated by females, even in this field, women make less than men. In fact, 98% of all jobs, women make less than men. But I've been told by several hostile and angry people, they've pointed it out to me, that female porn stars make more than men. So I, I guess we got something to be grateful for here. <laughs> There's a win. <laughs> so I'm talking about how women are more likely to live in poverty in their elder years. That this subconscious experience of our mothers, our mothers who could figure it all out, who could be industrious and generous to others, somehow by doing less for themselves, the truth is this new landscape of America, today that's not possible. Women can't do it anymore because we've crossed the tipping point and mama can't figure out how to do it with less. And I'm talking about the fact that she shouldn't have to. The subconscious bias is seen clearly in the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood bonus. Men who become fathers are 200% more likely to move up in management where women see a loss of 6% in earnings for each child they have. As the witty founder Carolyn Layton said, one of the ways that we can combat this is to call for company audits, to hire female employees, hire, hire female vendors, designers, ask can we hire a woman first. We can also go ask ourselves, am I giving women a fair chance at advancement? Am I really supporting female candidates at early stages in public life? Where does the bias start? One thing that I recommend before donating to a campaign, and we're launching into this big political campaign season, is to ask, 
your officials what they're going to do about fair pay and equality. Thanks to Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and the Nonpartisan Coalition of California Women's Caucus, right now California SB 358 passed the California State Senate. It was a few days ago, and that was the first hurdle. It was passed by a vote of 38 to 0, the California pay, Fair Pay Act. And this law protects women um, who discuss pay with coworkers and protects them from retaliation from employers. But we also need to support the Paycheck Fairness Act that will help us close many loopholes. We could tell officials that we want them to join the rest of the modern world and ensure constitutional equality for women in the USA by passing the Equal Rights Amendment. Do you want to hear the wording of the Equal Rights Amendment? Because it's really maddeningly reasonable. Here it is. Ready? <laughs> equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Is that really that difficult? <laughs> Is that so horrible to ask for? <laughs> I believe we have to make a push here to make an unnatural readjustment because our bias is so deep. We need to make a radical pivot on the spot if we're gonna see real change in our lifetime. Women have been bisected by opposing marching orders. Be more assertive. Don't be too aggressive. God forbid you'll be a bitch. If you aren't strong enough negotiator, you have yourself to blame. If you're too aggressive, you have yourself to blame. There are great lessons and strengths to learn in this, but really, women are trying to lean in. They are trying to lean out. Basically, women are doing the hokey pokey and turning themselves about. <laughs> and what do you want to hear when you have more than half the whole population of America, single breadwinning mothers, here it is. You have a population that arrives at the negotiations in a bad position from the word go. We need laws and we need our lawmakers to listen to what half the population needs. But I don't have to tell you this because I'm preaching to the choir and you all know the total number of women partners in venture capitals declined significantly since 1999. And you all know today that about 12% of women are graduating with computer science degrees versus 37% in 1984. That's more than 50% of women leaving jobs in tech because of hostile work environments. Some women in tech have talked about leaving because they have to choose between caring for their newborn for a reasonable amount of time or rushing back to work. This is a bizarre status quo. It's a total disregard nationally and a public disgrace. In the rest of the developed world, this is expected and standard. One of the buzzwords in the tech world is disruptions. All right, well, let's disrupt this, girls. <laughs> disrupt this gender di imbalance. In this room, there are more people who can make disruptions in this. You can carry the message on platforms that many people communicate on, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You're all across the board on the net. You're tech geniuses. Disrupt. You know how to amplify. Recently, I wrote an article for the Huffington Post, and I talked about bringing the nag back. Because, <laughs> again, the desire to silence our request was negatively labeled, labeled nagging. So I, can, I say, okay, it's time to bring the nag back. Let's nag till we get our way. And I'm going to talk about another little dirty word. In this big room, I'm going to talk about the word feminist. My mother never told me she was a feminist, even though she was an activist. I'd grown up in a world that responded to the word feminist like it was a dirty word, that being a feminist is something you shouldn't be. These snarling, vicious, dangerous band of lunatics, witches, crazy people, run or they will tear your penis off, they will burn your babies, they hate men. <laughs> so I'm going to say this once because I honestly think it's like a broken record. It's an old conversation to say that fighting for female economic opportunity and complete equality for women is about hating men. That's just crazy thinking. We take men into our beds, our arms. We nurse them at our breasts. We bury them with heavy hearts when they come back for more. And even if we've done none of these things, even if we love other women and take those women into our arms, we still love men. 
The argument about feminism is a smokescreen, a way to keep us from self-identifying, a way to dismantle our unity in this struggle. They count on the fact that it will be hard to change laws and bring about change if we don't band together. There are many women who still worry that men don't like feminists, that they might be angry at feminists, that they could feel intimidated by feminists. No, no more. We don't need to accept any negative connotations for our equal rights. We need to teach our daughters that feminism is not a dirty word. It is a word of empowerment. There is nothing to apologize for in taking action that brings about equality for women. We don't need to explain why equality for all is understandable, reasonable, responsible, and we sure as hell don't need to worry if it's unattractive. There are many men who identify as feminists now, men who love and support women, men who are educated and understand that women have been dealt a bad hand and who want to join with women and take actions that will address the systemic and longstanding injustices that have affected more than half the population to this day. And it's disrespectful to men to act like they can't handle the concept of equality without being challenged. Feminism as a word, as a name for a cause, all right, if not feminism, what? It would be hard to find any word to encapsulate the varied belief in female empowerment. Feminism is a self-identifying component used by men and women alike. It's part of who they are and how they see the world, a just world. Feminism is varied and beautiful and personal for each of us. It can be drastically different from person to person, just like women, our true, beautiful, and complicated essence. But here we are, here's the truth. We don't need to qualify to each other, the press, some political spin hound, our elected officials, or anyone else why we are feminist or might be feminist. Part of this is an education process for ourselves and others to embrace feminism with no apologies. It's about consciously moving ourselves and each other forward. It isn't about running away from the old opinions of what the world and the philosophy of feminism meant to the public consciousness of 1970 or 1920 or 1880. Here's the sad truth. The feminists of the past were only more advanced than the people of today. We can reclaim this world. We can reclaim our movement. In a recent college study, 72% of people said they didn't identify as feminists. 72% of them didn't even know what it really was. So this is dangerous. Because these kids have the most to lose. So why? What's happened here? In civil rights movements, there's no apologizing for moral growth and a fair and equal world. It was not enough for the LGBT community to have domestic partnerships. They were not afraid to fight to have marriage, the exact same word, the exact same rights under the law. They move forward bravely and are moving forward bravely today to have full equal rights under the law. And they're not gonna accept anything less than total legal equality. And they shouldn't accept less. And neither should women. We are not as human beings doing anyone a favor by allowing backwards and outmoded beliefs because people have a bad connotation of a word. The world has changed just as public consciousness about equality for many groups has changed. Social consciousness, global consciousness, connecting back to each other, supporting each other. Gratefully, we've seen some major steps forward in inequalities across many fronts in the USA. Clearly watching the news, we still have a long way to go. And we can move forward on all fronts at one time. And the truth is, in this world, this world needs us to move forward on all fronts. With the upcoming challenges that this world will be facing, if we don't make some serious changes for women, these women, our women, and their children who are barely treading water now will sink like stones if we don't come together and rise. So this is it. This is our time. This is about us and our daughters, our beauties. This is our lives. This is our shot to have the America we believe in. This is our chance to fight for equality for women. And if we stand together, we are 51% of the population, the largest voting bloc, and we can have it. Thank you. Thank you.
guess it's question and answer time. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yes. If you shout it, I'll, I'll say it back. <laughs> Patricia, so, thank you so much for that inspiring talk. Um, thank you. I have no questions to ask. I just wanted to tell you one thing. I saw the movie. I have a three and a half year old. And the one scene that stuck with me was the last scene when you're sending mm -hmm. your boy away and you said, I thought there was going to be more, mm. and that just stuck with me. And every day when I wake up and I see my three and a half year old, I always remember that, and mm. I spend my day with him making the choices that I have to as a working mother with that in my mind, that there, there is a limited finite opportunity for them to grow. So I when I when I saw that you were coming here I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for making that movie and for putting it out there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think a lot of people go through that experience whether they have children or not. I mean, I first felt that when I was 40. Uh just kind of dawned on me when I was a teenager, I thought I can't wait to have my own apartment and my own car, it's gonna be so fun. And then like the realities of life kind of dragged on and on and you know, insurance and everything and all taxes and oh my God, here it comes again. And finally I just, I woke up at 40 and I was like, I thought there would be more. I actually thought it was gonna be funner to be a grown up. <laughs> it turned out to be really tough. <laughs> But not that it wasn't fun too. But I think it's hard. I've always been a working parent. I had my son when I was 20. Um, but I think there's a value also to teaching your children, this is what grown-ups do. We have to work in the world. We have to provide for our kids. We have to be responsible for our things. I think a lot of things are how you frame them also. And I think sometimes women beat themselves up more than they should. Okay, she works in cybersecurity. Yes. <laughs> um, and some of the ladies here that are working with youngsters, I said to them, maybe one day because of Avery, they will actually start saving money and grow up. And they said, no, I don't want to do that. And I wonder if I can teach them to do a coin. Because they said, well, they signify if they're part of that community. Sure. As long as it's not low jacked. Um, <laughs> So she said that she works in cybersecurity and she was talking with some of the young women and she said, hopefully because my character is female and works in cybersecurity, girls will grow up and want to work in cybersecurity and she's going to give me a coin. So I just hope it's not like low jacked or something. She trained Pat hackers. Patricia, so I have a... I have a question, oh, please. Sorry, okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, question for you. Um, first of all, thank you so much. It was a very inspiring okay, speech. Um, one thing I'm seeing as a woman in tech is that I, I get some conflicting advices, right? Some people are working towards getting more women in higher ranks and, you know, talking about this openly, while some women that I've talked to about creating a women in leadership blog or, you know, sort of that moment dissuade me against that, saying that, you know, you might be alienated by the rest of the management because you're, like, shouting out too much about it. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on actually not just speaking up for it, but even bringing men into the fold. How, what are some of the tips from your experience on even bringing men into fighting for this? Well, I think there's a lot of really unreasonable, incredible men out there that really are allies of women and maybe haven't thought about it, looked at their unconscious bites, just like women haven't. Um, so I think you can definitely um, find allies who are men who 
many men are now were raised by a single mom and they recognize how hard it was for their mom and they want to be part of the change and they have daughters and they they understand that this is an important thing to to have happen also i guess i've read some data that said that when men do support women it makes a faster more radical change so it is important that we do have these open conversations about it but again i think instead of apologizing for the movement of equality, just saying, oh, no, 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 man. Equality is a great thing, a beautiful thing, something we should all be a part of. Um, I can't give you advice as far as how verbal to be or not to be because you know in your situation. I've certainly been verbal and it's blown up in my face and I've been verbal and it worked out great. So there's no, I don't think there's any quite answer, but I do think that this new law that passed, the fact that, you know, up until, well, it hasn't passed yet, but it passed its first hurdle. I mean, it, it's been illegal for people in the work environment to even talk about how much they're getting paid. And I've had so many women contact me and say, well, I work in accounting and I'll tell you right now, all these guys are making 30 grand more than I am for the same job. Over and over I'm hearing this story. People who are training men who are making three times what that woman's making at an entry-level position, the men are making three times what that woman's been making for years. So it is a very important and real conversation. Um, and I, I do think, you know, we, we have to keep moving it forward. We, we have to have the conversation because we know what happens when we stop having the conversation. My question is about your uh, choices that you made. So if I think about Medium, Cyber, uh, CSI Cyber, and Boyhood, in all three movies, in all three uh, series, you are a woman of real life. It's, and the question is, is this, these choices part of the vision or the mission that you chose professionally and personally? Because if I think about the Oscar speech, it's what in probably more, for many of us would have been considered a, a CLM, career limiting move to put that on the stage. Mm -hmm. So is that choices aware or just the way your career or your character as an actress became the one that you would be thought after for those roles? Um, I think it's always been a part of who I am. I think because my parents were activists and my mom really uh, my mom was this person who, I remember there's a story of a bus pulling up and the bus driver didn't want to stop long enough to let the uh, uh, physically disabled person break down the wheelchair and get on the bus. So my mom was like, you have to stop. And the bus driver was trying to pull away. So my mom laid down in the middle of the street in front of the bus <laughs> like, then drive over me. Um, so that's who my mom was. So. <laughs> I mean, I did come in as an ingenue, and I happened to look a certain way. I never saw myself as beautiful, but I guess I was beautiful enough to trick them into thinking I was beautiful. But by the time I got to do medium, I had enough power that one of, one of the producers was like, well, honey, I think you need to lose a little weight. I said, why? No. There's no reason my character needs to lose weight. She's got three kids. She's in this happy family. You're wrong, man. People want to see someone they know in their life, someone real, reasonable. I don't buy any character that's normal who happens to have four hours to work out a day. It's like, oh, well, you're, oh, you're, hmm, I don't know how you're that ripped and you're living on food stamps. It looks really, I just don't buy it. Uh, so I, I also thought that it just didn't feel like authentic to me, even as an actor, let alone as a woman. And I also, we have so many girls that are struggling with you know, their own dysmorphic concepts of what their body is supposed to look like. And now we have this new world where sexuality is so indoctrinated by the internet and they're looking at what they're supposed to look like, what is attractive, they're comparing themselves to the norm of, of this, you know, pornography industry is their introduction to sexuality. Their first images of what the body looks like in a sexual state is already distorted. I don't want to be a part of that. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, guys.
I know that we all have amazing questions we would love to ask her, so thank you for sitting through. Um, we do have some words from our founder, Carolyn Layton, so please welcome Carolyn. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so <clears throat> what I think everyone here, and certainly I love about Patricia, is she is a woman who decided to take a stand and be courageous. This is such an example of taking a stand and being courageous. And her mother, I want to acknowledge for lying down in front of a bus. <laughs> I mean, that was amazing. <clears throat> so we can hear the story, we can be inspired, and leave it up to Patricia to take a stand. Or every one of us can make a decision here tonight that we're going to take a stand. Because we are a special group of women. We have tools and jobs that many women will never have the opportunity to get. <clears throat> and I believe very strongly that those of us who have have to take a stand for those of us who don't have. And that's what Patricia is doing every day of her life. And she made a decision that really struck me because we, each of us has the opportunity to make a decision right now that I am not going to settle for anything less than being authentic and making my life make a difference. So here I stand at 74 years old. <laughs> Thank you. Witty is 26 years old. And every day we make decisions that will be tomorrow's reality. So I'm totally inspired by the work Patricia is doing because she had a lot of other choices. And yet she chose to make a difference and to make her life make a difference. And everyone in this room has gifts that absolutely astonish me every time I come here. And every one of you should settle for nothing less than being authentic, taking a stand, for each other, for yourself, and making your life really make a difference because it's over in a second. So do it, and I want to hear from every one of you what you're going to do to make a difference. So thank you, and thank you, Patricia.